The Grateful Dead was an American rock band formed in 1965 in Palo Alto, California. The band is known for its eclectic style, which fused elements of rock, folk, country, jazz, bluegrass, blues, gospel, and psychedelic rock, for live performances of lengthy instrumental jams, and for its devoted fan base, known as Deadheads. Their music, writes Lenny Kay, touches on ground that most other groups don't even know exists. These various influences were distilled into a diverse and psychedelic whole that made the Grateful Dead, the pioneering godfathers of the jam band world. The band was ranked 57th by Rolling Stone magazine in its The Greatest Artists of All Time issue. The band was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1994 and a recording of their May 8, 1977 performance at Cornell University's Barton Hall was added to the National Recording Registry of the Library of Congress in 2012. The Grateful Dead have sold more than 35 million albums worldwide. The Grateful Dead was founded in the San Francisco Bay Area amid the rise of the counterculture of the 1960s. The founding members were Jerry Garcia, lead guitar, vocals, Bob Weir, rhythm guitar, vocals, Ron Pigpen, McKernan, keyboards, harmonica, vocals, Phil Lesh, bass, vocals, and Bill Kreutzmann, drums. Members of the Grateful Dead had played together in various San Francisco bands, including Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions and the Warlocks. Lesh was the last member to join the Warlocks before they became the Grateful Dead. He replaced Dana Morgan Jr., who had played bass for a few gigs. Drummer Mickey Hart and non-performing lyricist Robert Hunter joined in 1967. With the exception of McKernan, who died in 1973, and Hart, who took time off from 1971 to 1974, the core of the band stayed together for its entire 30-year history. The other official members of the band are Tom Constantin, keyboards, 1968-1970, John Perry Barlow, non-performing lyricist, 1971-1995, Keith Godshow, keyboards, 1971-1979, Donna Godshow, vocals, 1972-1979, Brent Midland, keyboards, vocals, 1979-1990, and Vince Welnick, keyboards, vocals, 1990-1995. Bruce Hornsby, accordion, piano, vocals, was a touring member from 1990 to 1992, as well as a guest with the band on occasion before and after the tours. After the death of Garcia in 1995, former members of the band, along with other musicians, toured as the other ones in 1998, 2000, and 2002, and the dead in 2003, 2004, and 2009. In 2015, the four surviving core members marked the band's 50th anniversary in a series of concerts that were billed as their last performances together. There have also been several spin-offs featuring one or more core members, such as Dead & Company, Further, The Rhythm Devils, Phil Lesh & Friends, Ratdog, and Billy and & The Kids. no relationship that I've ever been able to hear on tapes between the way I feel and the way it, it went down, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't? No. I haven't been able to hear it matter. It matters how I feel to me, of course, because that, you know, I feel that way, you know. I come off the stage, boy, sometimes really, really upset, you know. And when I was younger, I would get even more upset, I'd get more crazy, I would want it to be really good, you know, and I'd think, wow, it's not, it's not where it should be. It's almost there, but it's not there, and then I get really angry. I remember one time we, were, we did the carousel and we recorded. I got really upset at the end of the set.
I thought, because I thought it was just horrible for some reason. I thought it was, it seemed like everything was a struggle. And uh, I got real pissed off at Phil and grabbed him and threw him down this little flight of stairs. You know, it's like, man, I've never done that. And Phil, you know, I've been really tight with him for years. I was that freaked out, you know, and high too, you know, flipped out. You know. Music was fucked, you know. And then we listened to these tapes months later and ended up using them on our album, man. They were, you know, they were, you know, they were crackling with energy. They were amazing. But, you know, that's what I knew that, wow, oh, fuck, why? I just got to learn to keep my mouth shut, you know, and just not even think about what, whether, whether it seemed like it was happening to me or not. Yeah, this in a way, see, like doing all this stuff is an accident. I mean, ending up professionally playing music and all this, it's, it's, it's like some lucky dream. I didn't ever expect to, uh, I, didn't, I mean, that wasn't even... It's it easy wasn't, working. Yeah, right. You know, it's like I get, I get to play music, and not only that, but, you know, I get, yeah, I get paid else. for it, too. That's incredible, <laughs> you know, because I would do it, you know, either, no matter what, whether I got paid for it or not, you know, and it's not even, that ain't even... Right, I met Bob Dylan, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I mean, shit, yeah. I don't know, I don't know what it is or anything about it. I just, I know that, I, that where I'm coming from, it doesn't matter too much. I would, I just dig doing I'm into doing it. Guess it's you and me, Bob. Uh, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you people anyway? I mean, uh, we're, we're musicians. We <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, there is another reason too. There's another reason. I remember. <laughs> Dig this. There's another reason. We're playing in theaters. You know, these are theaters. Like normally we play arenas and these colossal, gigantic places where if you had an acoustic, even an electric acoustic guitar, mm -hmm. it would feedback horrendously, and the technical problems involved in it are just they're hopeless in a really big place. I mean, at least they're hopeless for us. Somebody else might be able to I think we could do it. I think we could do it now. Which came first, the idea of the hall or the idea of the acoustic set? Uh, no, oh, well, well, no. <laughs> that's kind of like a... That's a non-question. I mean, we, we played acoustic music before. We used acoustic instruments on records, you know what I mean? Sure. It's like we're not strangers to it. So, you, I, I mean, I, you have to say the acoustic music came first, you know? But on the other hand, Radio City Music Hall was built before we were born. <laughs> I mean, what's the question? Uh, would, say it again real slow. It puts us all physically a lot closer together, so it's easier yeah. to hit uh, the other guys in the band right. without having to get up and move around a lot. <laughs> Anything that we really can't stand? Uh, well, that elevator music gets annoying. <laughs> it is true. But even that gets groovy sometimes. So, yeah, I've heard some stuff that was really soul-wrenching elevator music. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It makes a tear to your eye. I was choked up. I had to get I missed my floor. I couldn't. Well, anybody got any intelligent questions? <laughs> Have we tried no. <laughs> That shit never works. Okay, can we call this meeting to a close? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> Those cars are still coming at us. But it was in the air. Uh, there was all those books out, like Doors to Perception, all this. There was tremendous curiosity about psychedelics, and there were some people who had, who even had, uh, who were able to get peyote buns in those days mm -hmm. before uh, manufactured LSD was around. And so the psychedelic experience was known and you know, in certain circles, I, I think. And there were a lot of people who were just really curious and uh, interested in finding out what it was about and what it was like. You know, it was a matter of. It was like the space shuttle. Yeah, it was something to try. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, exactly right. He's right. It was a technological improvement. Yeah, you know, something new. Yeah, or a fast right. car. You know? It went to Jupiter. I mean. Yeah, that's right. right. Exactly it was right. the passage back that we had trouble with. I understand. Isn't that all? Were you able to function playing music while you were on LSD? Uh, well, not in a conventional way. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that is to say that uh, a lot of you certainly lose a lot of stuff. I've, it's something I wouldn't want. I wouldn't do uh, professionally. You know what I mean? Uh, now, now I feel more of a sense of uh, responsibility to at least be able to to be in command, to be able to play physically. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a uh, uh, the nice thing about the acid test was that we could play or not. 
in the acid test. And a lot of times we would get just too, we'd be too high really to play. And we'd play for maybe a minute. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and then we lose it, but, you know, and, but, uh, but, and we'd have to leave. But you know, it felt like hours. It was too weird I mean, for me. No. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, but on the other hand, sometimes we would play, and uh, since there was no pressure on us, I mean, people didn't come in to see the Grateful Dead. They came to the acid test. It was uh, the whole event that counted. So we weren't in the spotlight, and therefore we, the pressure wasn't on us. So when we did play, we played with a certain kind of freedom that you rarely get as a musician. I mean, we didn't have, not only did we not have to fulfill expectations about us, but we didn't have to fulfill expectations about music either. So in terms of being, ex <laughs> you know, being able to experiment freely, you know, it was amazing, amazingly great for that, on that level. Their leader, Jerry Garcia, has been called by the Los Angeles Times one of the most intelligent and articulate of all rock stars. Fifteen years, still going strong, five originals still with the band. Look how healthy they look here. Uh, yeah. Special treat for us this morning is Papa Bear himself, Jerry Garcia. Good morning. Howdy. You go to sleep last night? No. When's the last time you were sleeping? <laughs> well, what year is this? <laughs> Sorry. How do you play at that, at that frantic volume? and sustain uh, any kind of rational it's mind. It's like a dog hanging his head out a car window. You love it. Yeah. What would happen if you played music without all that sound? Would the music sound totally different? Well, only the first three or four people would hear it. In the country, why do these kids travel thousands, literally, of miles to hear your concert? Um, I, think it's, I think because we make an effort to, uh, uh, to treat them decently and uh, to play honestly for them rather than put on a some sort of packaged uh, pre-arranged predetermined show or some form some showbiz formula and that might be that might have something to do with it but I, but uh, I don't know I mean I can't uh, I can't say exactly what it is I, if I knew that I'd uh, you know I'd be running the world <laughs> well, one thing that I think that's healthy stuff that's okay with me as long as the people who are doing the taping aren't obnoxious about it uh -huh. I mean and that's I, I have to view it from that point of view because uh, at the worst, there's, uh, you know, uh, somebody will complain that there's too much uh, hassling for the best spots and that kind of stuff. You know, I saw, as far as I'm concerned, those, those matters don't really happen to me experientially, but I hear about them. And when I, if I hear that somebody in the audience is unnecessarily rude or, or copying an attitude of some kind, or, you know, it, it's uh, the thing of, uh, that everybody who's doing it should just be aware of everybody else who's there, that's all. Uh, Something and, like that. and respect their space. If too. possible, sure. I understand that. Yeah. Um, you can dig that, can't you? Sure about you can. the, uh, the, the Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty tour that uh, yeah. we just finished, how did it go for you? What were the highlights? Well, I was dying. <laughs> uh, well, other, than, other than that. Other than that. <laughs> other than my decaying hell. Yes, right. <laughs> The rest of it was pretty fun, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But you know, hey, shit, I'm still a little mushy. You yeah. Know? I, mean, I mean, I found myself in the weird position of teaching Dylan his own songs. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was interesting. It's right? really strange. <laughs> it was funny. He was great. He was so good about all this stuff. And we were doing, we were going to do, we were set, wanted to do Desolation Row with him. You know, it's got a million words. And uh, so Weir says, "Are you sure you'll remember all the words?" Dylan says, "I'll remember the important ones." <laughs> <laughs> He was really great. He really was. It was it was fun to do it. It was fun to it was uh, fun. Well, uh, we we talk now with uh, on video with both Phil and Bob, and they both said that they expect some those change. lying sons of bitches. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute! You I wouldn't what? invite them to a dog show. <laughs> Shit. So uh, Jerry Garcia band's going to be going solo for a while. <laughs> So, but they both said that they expect some changes in the Grateful Dead's concert format, um, like the, maybe more improvisational stuff, changing songs around a little bit, maybe drums not necessarily occurring before space, and maybe then it's starting a show with drums or starting starting a space. Or not. Or you not. Know, I mean, uh, whole whole weeks have gone by when I didn't know what the hell was going on. But I mean. But you don't have a choice. Uh, you can't opt out. You know, you can't. Hey, fuck, man! I'm confused. I'm leaving. You know, mm -hmm. it's. It, you know, the thing to do is to stand there and slug it out. And uh, the Grateful Dead's music is successful on lots of different levels. Sometimes it's successful when when we don't agree. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when the band doesn't come to some understanding during the course of the evening. Sometimes that music is extremely interesting. Sometimes it's not. Yeah. But sometimes when we're playing and thinking we're doing really great, it's terribly dull. You know, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things that there is no way apart. For me, the experience is way too personal 
uh, to me, to, for me to make any kind of real honest generalizations about it, and certainly to predict anything is hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite facility to play in? Is there one that you like more than any other facility? I like the feeling in the Oakland Auditorium, although I don't know whether the sound is any good. I've never heard, I've never heard us anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, you know, so I, don't, I really don't know. I only know how they feel. Uh, Madison Square Garden is a great place to play because it's so juiced. Yeah, right. Actually, the easier question is, are there any places I really don't like to okay, play? Okay, are there any places you really don't like to play? Yeah. There's a couple of places I really don't like Would you like, would to, you like to name them? I, I don't remember what they are. Okay. I only know that when we get into it, I go, oh, God damn it, we're in this place again. This place <laughs> sounds like shit. And, uh, you know, that's how, I mean, I don't try, I don't retain those memories, you know what I mean? It's like I'm on to the next one as much as possible. It's, yeah. it's, that's what happened to me is I woke up in a hospital. I really don't know what happened. I don't know, uh, uh, they tell me it was bad, you know, but uh, they also tell me that, that my recovery is remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think really that the just the thing of ha of lots and lots of deadheads putting good energy into me while I was uh, uh, laid up really helped me come out of it. You know, I really, I really, I think that had a lot to do with it. I'm not a believer in that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I, uh, but I feel I have some evidential proof. You know what Obviously, I mean? Yeah. That. Uh, Healing vibes have something. I mean, the doctors said they'd never seen anybody as sick as me who wasn't dead. You know, so that I mean, if that's any indication, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, apparently I was real sick. Although I, I got to tell you, I didn't, didn't experience any pain or any discomfort really, apart from the thing of just being wired. Yeah. Jerry, 24 years together. When a fan looks at the 24 years, they see hits, they see concerts, they see tours. When you look back, what do you see? <laughs> oh God! Uh, I see. Uh, well, a large part of my life I've spent doing something which has turned out to be more fun than I thought it was going to be, and it's lasted way longer than I imagined it might, and it's taken me places that I would never have ever imagined. You know, so it's. I mean, uh, it's it's hard to uh, to separate myself from you know what I mean from this from the experience. I mean, after all, it is my life. You know, <laughs> it's like. For me, it's 24 years of all kinds of stuff of, uh, of, you know, uh, like everybody goes through, you know, life and death and kids growing up and, uh, and you know, stuff happening. And the Grateful Dead has been this one constant, uh, c continuous source for the during the whole thing. So it's it's a big, uh, big chunk, you know. It 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 stopped being stuff like a career or a band or even a family and that kind of stuff a long time ago it, it's gone way past that you know by now how did touch of gray that success change the band or did it it didn't really change it very much no uh, uh, mostly it made it so that that now having lunch with record company guys very comfortable you know? <laughs> <laughs> really nice you know getting me today aren't you uh deadheads uh well, my experience with them is like is, is again it's hard to characterize. It's been a long time now, and there's been lots of them, and they come in all shapes and sizes and forms, and they're they're everything from uh, street people to uh, uh, solid professionals. You know, they're all over the place. They're they're on Capitol Hill. You know, they're they're in part of Heart and Lung Team. You know, out in Sacramento, they're everywhere. They're, they they do they they permeated society. You know, they've they've become. Uh, uh, mainstream in a way. I mean, there's a lot of mainstream deadheads. Even the New York City Police Department's got a lot of deadheads, and it's, they're all over the place. So it's like that's kind of fun, you know. Uh, we meet people who are, uh, you know, the mayor of Milwaukee. You know, <laughs> you know, was comfortable enough to bring his wife. Him and his wife come to the show. You know, hey, I'm the mayor of Milwaukee. You know, oh sure, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. You know. <laughs> No, I am really. He says, and he brings out, he brings out the car. The guy really was the mayor of Milwaukee, and a really nice guy. And it seems like the word for the Grateful Dead in concert is improvise. Yeah, that well, we would probably do. We would probably reproduce the record exactly if we were disciplined enough to do it. But the record is kind of like a uh, a painting, you know. Uh, it, it it's you have a chance to really study every all the detail, and you can you can be sure that. Everything that happens in the song uh, has the benefit of uh, supervision, 
you, you can pay attention to incredible detail. When you're playing live, it's uh, a whole lot. It's a whole other experience. It's it's uh, like a snapshot. You know, it's like a Polaroid. It it what what you, what's there is what's there, and the moment provides new things. Sometimes sometimes they're better, sometimes they're worse, but they're they're really it's re they're really two different things. It's like apples and oranges almost. You know, it's uh, it's it just. For us, that's been our our big trouble making records. Really, is we've never been able to get that live energy into the grooves, you know. And, and we go in the studio, and we might be able to get it to sound superficially okay, but it's just no life, you know. It'd be like, you know. Uh, when you were a young man, just getting into rock and roll, did you have any idea of the road that was before you? And are you pleased with how it's turned out? Oh yeah, it's turned out a million times better than I could have imagined. You know, I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, I, I hoped. I think uh, when we started playing, I, I hoped for something better than just, uh, or something more interesting than just, uh, say, like conventional success. You know, and it's always been more interesting, and it's, it hasn't been at all conventional. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. I'm real happy. First of all, Rainforest, why did you get involved in, in the Rainforest effort? Uh, well, for, uh, well, for us, it's hard for us to find anything that we all agree on. So uh, the Rainforest is one of those things that that's, uh, falls into the uh, realm of general social responsibility. And none of us could say that it doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Anything else political, we can disagree about, but uh, but uh, the rainforest uh, and other other environmental concerns are, are something that we can all relate to. We all have kids. We all we all live in this world, and you know. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me ask one Grateful Dead question. So okay. Boys back. <laughs> uh, first of all, I noticed you scuba diving your black T-shirt. It's uh, that's all right. <laughs> These are my special scuba shirts. The uh, in between China Cat Sunflower and I know you rider where you break into <laughs> where you break into da 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 that yeah. line. Yeah. Did you plan that out? Like, did you work that out and take that to somebody in rehearsal, or did that just ha it evolve just, on it, stage? It evolved on stage. Well, really? uh, no, I, I would say 80 percent of what we do evolved on stage. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I'd say it's probably closer to 90 percent. Uh, I mean, in terms of the things that happen instrumentally. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jerry Garcia, and I play the guitar for the Grateful Dead, amongst other things. And uh, your own musical influences when you were growing up, who did you listen to as a, as a kid? Uh, do you really, want, you, you really want to hear that? I had lots, I had eclectic influences, let's put it that way. I, I, I heard virtually every kind of music. My father was a musician, you know. My mother was a, was a, um, a coloratura. Uh, you know, soprano, and uh, I just, you know, I mean, I heard every kind of music. I, my mother, my grandmother loved uh, country music, uh, the Grand Ole Opry, and Harry Owens and his Royal Hawaiians. I mean, I heard all kinds of things. I, my ears were full of music, you know, so I had plus the popular music of the time, the 40s and 50s, you know, when I was growing up. But I was uh, at the the inception of the rock and roll. I listened to rhythm and blues. I had an older, older brother who was a rhythm and blues nut, and so I got rhythm and blues from him. And then rock and roll, as it developed in the 50s, uh, was like my music. That was my native music, so to speak. And then, then the the rock and roll wave came up, you know, with the Beatles and stuff like that. And hey, that looks like it'd be fun to do. And besides, I know this music, you know. Uh, and so, having a preference for the kind of more um, like the Chicago sound, the blues sound, the Marshall chess sound, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, our band, when we started a band, it was kind of more like the Rolling Stones, say, insofar as it was that, that kind of music. Uh, we started playing not quite a blues band, band, you know, sort of a blues band, and uh, with kind of folk and country and western overtones. So that's you know that's that's my background pretty much. But it really there's there's nothing I haven't heard. I mean, the, in the, when the Grateful Dead first started, we were called the Warlocks. We used to we we had one strong suit. We had Pigpen in the band, and he was this guy from Palo Alto whose father had been a, a rhythm and blues disc jockey. So he for him the blues was, was very natural, uh, and he played harmonica, 
uh, uh, and he sang really well, you know, and uh, he really had no real wish to be a performer. We sort of forced him into it because we knew he could do it. And uh, so he was kind of the front man for the band. He, he, was, he, was our, he was our powerhouse guy. And the rest of us could play better than him, but he could sing better than us or anybody else. So that, he, that, he got to be the front man for the band. And uh, uh, it, it, it worked well. We eventually, we ended up kind of uh, playing the divorcees clubs up and down the Bay Area, you know, down the peninsula and East Bay and San Francisco. We ended up playing Broadway in San Francisco, which was about as far as you could go as a band in those days, you know. <laughs> well, Cassidy is one of the kind of people that you, you, you know, it's, it, he's so, uh, such a, he was such an overwhelming um, trip. <laughs> Cassidy, I don't know, I, I, it's hard to even know what to say about Cassidy, he was so singular. I mean, it's just, well, for one thing, he was like the best uh, the, the ultimate uh, sight gag person, you know what I mean? Physical comedy person, you know? Uh, plus, he was also the world's best stand-up comic, too. Uh, he had an incredible mind that he would do this thing. He did it to everybody. Everybody has reported on this. He did it to everybody. You might not see him for months, you know? And he would pick up exactly where he left off the last time he saw you. You know, like, in the middle of a sentence, <laughs> he would pick up and you, you, first of all, you go, what? What the hell? And then you realize, oh, yeah, this is that story he was telling me last time. You know? And <laughs> you, it was like so mind-boggling, you couldn't believe that he was doing it. He used to do this thing that was, this, this was something that used to, that killed me, and I see it, saw him do it a lot of times. He'd take a, a dollar bill, you know, from anybody, you know, and take a dollar bill, and he would, he'd, he'd Put his hand on it like this, and he, he and they and they say the numbers, you know, the the serial number, and you know I've saw saw him get it right like two or three times, the serial numbers, you know what I mean? He just had this, he had this thing, you know, and his driving, yeah. I went, if you go for a drive with him, it was like the ultimate fear experience, you know, that you, you knew you were you knew you were going to die, and there was no question about it, and it was something so unbelievable he he loved big uh detroit irons you know big cars and he he like driving in san francisco he would go down those hills you know like 50 miles and 60 miles an hour and do corners you know blind corners going down those hills you know, if you can imagine like going down uh franklin you know like top speed <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> you know disregarding anything stop signs signals all the time talking to you, and f maybe fumbling around with a little teeny roach, you know, trying to put it in a matchbook, you know, and also tuning the radio, maybe, and also talking to whoever else is in the car, and it never seeming to ever put his eyes on the road, ever, <laughs> you know, and this is like, it would be, you'd be just dying, you know, you'd be, you'd be dying, and, it, and he would just, it, he would, he, it would effectively take you past that whole fear of death thing, you know. It's like a, a difficult experience because there's nothing else like it, apart from like almost like surviving an airplane crash, possibly or something. I don't know what. And he was the art also, and he was doing it consciously as well. You know, so he had he did things. He he worked with the world. I remember one time after a a, a party, or after the Watts acid test, which was particularly strange. And he's first of all he, he George Walker's driving the bus. So George, George is driving the bus, George, and, and Neil is like the guy directing him into the parking place, you know, you know, a little to the left, a little to the right, he's doing it all with signals, and he, he directs him right into a, a stop sign, an arterial stop sign, and knocks it, it shears it off, boom, and the stop sign falls down. So then Neil gets up, so then, then the bus is parked, but Neil gets up and he's got the stop sign, you know, and he's like kind of trying to put it, make it stand up, you know. And so he's there with this stop sign, and down the street come like two really straight little old ladies, you know, and they're on their way to church Sunday morning, you know, and here's Neil, he's like the cosmic village drunk, you know what I mean, he's like, and he's got the stop sign, you know, and they're, they're trying not to see him, you know, and he's doing this whole, whole series of, uh, kind of like, good morning, ma'am, you know, kind of pantomime, you know, this extravagant thing all the time with, 
he would kind of like stand up the stop sign and then walk away from it and it'd start to fall and he'd grab it just as I'm about to hit, you know, and it, all this stuff happened and it was like amazingly great. It was just beautiful, perfect timing, you know, and it's just extraordinarily beautiful, you know, and he, he, his, the way his body moved, the way he looked and everything like that was just absolutely, his face was so expressive, he would go through millions of expressions, just millions of them, and just his whole body language and everything, it was so communicative, it was just amazing, it was, I, I, I was dying, I thought I was going to die, it was so hilarious, it was so, and it, it was absolutely perfect, you know, it was like a little silent movie, a silent ballet, you know, in the morning, it lasted about maybe a minute and a half, you know, two minutes, but it was perfect, you know, it was like a perfect moment, it was just great, and I mean, Neil, Neil was that guy, I mean, he, he, he just could do that, you know, that's, that's who he was, you know, he was that guy in the real world, you know, he was, this. I mean, you, you have so much confidence, and I mean, you don't feel like you have to, uh, you know, go berserk in order to make people hear what you're, uh, getting across. Well, I, I'm hoping to not have to go berserk at all. <laughs> I mean, I will if it, the situation really calls for it, but really, I, my model for playing is is based on a psychedelic experience also. My, my model for, like, when I go on stage, what am I trying to accomplish? Okay, here's the story. <laughs> and there's one time we played, it, it was, we were playing at the old Fillmore, and it was after Bill Graham wasn't running it anymore. So, so there was some independent, like a hippies, some some hippies, local hippies. So somebody, some this guy who was like sort of a famous freak and, and that ran around the scene in those days, comes in and he's got this big birthday cake. He's got this huge big birthday cake. You know, you look. I'm looking at it, thinking that that thing has got to be dosed. I just know this this sucker. I know, I, just, I know it's dosed. You know, I'm looking at it and looking at it, looking at it, and thinking, yeah, that's what you, I'm sure it's dosed. And then I said, but it, it looked good. You know, it was beautiful. This beautiful big. You know, so I thought, ah, well, I'll just I'll just take a little a little of the frosting here. You know, just, just you know, <laughs> I'll just take a little snack. <laughs> so I took this, and then somebody comes in and says, yeah, we put. Uh, about 800 hits of acid in that frosting, you know, and I go, oh, oh, God, you know, I'm gonna, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm gonna be totally fucking wiped out with this, you know, and, and by this time, I didn't really enjoy playing, uh, you know, under the influence of psychedelics, because I didn't have the freedom to quit if I wanted to, and it wasn't really that much fun to play when you, when you don't have the option. You know, when you don't have options. So, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it wasn't something I was looking forward to. And, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting to play. And we're, we're, and we're going and later. It gets getting later and later and later. And I'm coming on. Now I'm going on. And I figure, wow, the place is swimming. And, and I start to hear the overhear people, you know. And I, I'm going, all going off in this paranoid space. And I'm thinking, God, this place is full of mafia guys. And they're all trying to kill me, you know. <laughs> I got that notion in my head, you know. This guy, you know, this guy comes in. He's, he looks, he looks exactly like a mafia guy. You know, he says, "Here, you want something to drink?" I look at it, oh, poison. You know, death. no, no, th no, thanks. You know, <laughs> it's like everybody is armed to the teeth. They're all trying to kill me. Okay, so and we're I'm waiting there, going, "Oh shit, I'm, this is it. This is my last life, night on earth." You know, I'm convinced of this now. Yeah, <laughs> still in this house, I can like a roar. You know. And so we're going out on stage, you know, to go play, and I'm I'm going out there, and I'm thinking, oh god, you know, Jesus, what have I done to deserve this? You know, I'm going to go out there and play, and they're going to fucking kill me, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I go out, and the only thing I could think of to do was I I, I said, okay, I, I'm just going to play for my life. I'm going to play for my life. That's what I'm going to do, you know. And so I played for my life, and they let me live. <laughs> Ever since then, you know, I mean, that, so that, you know, ever since then, I thought, that works, you know, for me, is to, to play for my life. You know, so, you know, that, that uh, you know, when I forget what I'm doing or why I'm doing it, I, I play for my life. But how do you hope your legacy reads? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, let me see. Well, you're already in who's who and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 uh... I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, ideally, I would like to disappear gracefully and not not leave behind any legacy to hang people up. You know what I mean? I, I don't want people agonizing over what, who or what I was when I was here when I'm not here anymore. You know, I'd rather they did that now while I'm here. Yeah. New York wasn't calling to me. You know, I really. You know, we say about that time, two people from New York were starting to come out here. You know, out from the West Coast, you know. Yeah, this is a real creative, uh, sort of a little uh, 
birthplace of a lot of. It was just starting to light up a little out here, you know, and and that one. Then you know things started r really rolling. Then I mean, it, this is right about when like. The, this is still early 60s, early this is like 62, 61, 62, 63, right around there. I mean, I still had a few years to go as a, uh, during the folk scare, you know, uh, to get to be a real competent bluegrass player, and that was my connection to New York. That's where I met the New York guys, because they, they were the first serious folkies. And so the bluegrass players, the first ones that I met that could really cut it, were from the East Coast. Yeah, yeah and, and they were amazed that I was out here on the West Coast, and although there was a couple of us out here that could play well. And so that, that, that started happening, you know, that reciprocal thing and, uh, you know, like that. And it, it started, once it got, got rolling, it started moving really fast, you know, all this stuff started moving really fast. I mean, within the space of a year or so, then of course Kennedy got snapped, boom, bam, you know, oh, whole other world, you know, new reality, you know, put on the brakes, you know, to check things out, go, you know what I mean? It was like, uh, that was another impetus, it was like, now what? Uh, okay, fuck you, you know? <laughs> Fuck you, you know. If you're gonna shoot, the, if, you, if every time you have something that's good, it's gonna get shot. Fuck it, you know. We're not gonna let you have it anymore. <laughs> you know, things, everything changed then, you know. And also, that's about the time we started to leave leave Palo Alto. I mean, Palo Alto started seeming too small, and, uh, and other things were calling us. The city seemed like a better. Well, the city, yeah, was was the, the acid test actually is what got us, which was like. Uh, I, like we went to the moon or Mars or something like that. We went to another reality rather than this one, and it, it served better, you know. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was uh, truly cosmic kind of entertainment. But it, it, you know, it actually it actually brought a lot of Palo Alto, Palo Alto along with it. It's strange, you know. I mean, you know, if, it'd be hard to. It's hard to sort of separate one thing in and out. But it, it was the lifestyle, the way of life there was easy. People weren't afraid. You could get out and be on the streets in the middle of the night hollering, and nobody would bother you. The police wouldn't think there was somebody being killed. You know what I mean? They, they, it wasn't. It wasn't worst case uh, um, preparation. You know, they weren't. Re they weren't ready for the, the most horrible thing to be happening. And it, it really was horrible. It was almost always innocent and, and pleasant, even. And uh, it was just a great, great way to live. You know, it was a great place to live, a great way to live, and the, and the people were nice and. Uh, we, we were lucky enough to get to be able to get weird at a time when, uh, as far as psychedelics were concerned, they were still legal, for one thing. And the other thing was that nobody knew what the fuck they were. Yeah. You know, so if, you're, if your behavior defies description, you know what I mean? What's the guy doing? Well, I don't know. He's kind of he's sort of standing up. So he's over, upside down by the lamppost over there. He's got one leg uh, wrapped around this the telephone pole and he's he's pumping his arms out and he's screaming something about Merry Christmas I don't know what that is you know it's like you know your behavior is so weird and you know and but you're not harming anybody or scaring anybody I mean it's, and the people realize that this guy's harmless you know it, it, it really it's okay you can be as weird as you want it's like in, in England they have this thing where uh, as long as you don't bother anybody you can be as weird as you want and they kind of they kind of treasure their mad people you know they kind of like it if you're in if you're crazy, no problem, you know? <laughs> Less yeah. uptight, more fun time, more just a period that was... Uh, yeah, well, for, for us, that we had as much time to be young and uh, carefree and and having a wonderful time, uh, sort of, that sort of life. We had as much of it as anybody could possibly want. I mean, it, it, was, it was really great, it really was. And it, it was also enough time to... to uh, Develop the skills that you needed, like for me, for, for being able to uh, spend enough time working on my playing, so that uh, it wasn't developed in a frenzy. It was developed out of love, my own personal love for it, you know. And you know, it, that's really well put. Uh, well, it's, I don't know any other way to say it, really, because uh, I did meet people who learned under other way, uh, other ways, you know, other sort of other envelopes. And it's not that that. They could do, I mean, the, what they did technically was any better or anything, but sometimes it had a, a darker purpose to it, sort of. I mean, it was good and everything, it was well executed, but it, but sometimes it lacked that the thing of heart, you know, how music should have, should always have it, even mechanistic music. Two minutes to the end of the tape. I got nothing else to say about it. <laughs> well, I, I want to, John was very, 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 very pumped about this, and I, I, wanted, I promised him that I would not. You were trying to do with this film to show that the 
how often the, the, that part of the world, this part of the world, has, has gone through a, a genuine historical renaissance period. Uh, and, and music's part of that, art's part of that. You're, you're more than just a musician. I don't think that I, I don't think that Palo Alto had a clue. It, 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 the reason anything at all might have happened there was because there was a lot of people there, and it's a college campus is always kind of protein. It, it, it was not that anybody welcomed any of it. You know, nobody welcomed any of it. You know, really, and it really it was a couple of doctors that opened up the, the place there at the tangent, the top of the tangent, and uh, they were slightly visionary. You know, just slightly. You know. And they liked the music, and that was it. It wasn't wasn't because there uh, any part of say the university or the the hierarchy of uh, the community itself. You know, any not a clue. <laughs> you know, I mean, not. To, I don't know whether it would have been possible for it to, to to do anything but scare it. You know what I mean? It, it, it wouldn't have been helpful. And the nature of what was happening was so delicate, and so bizarre, and it had a kind of, uh, it had a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a kind of unfocused, uh, diffuse, well, I mean, it's the sort of thing that it, it's difficult to talk about even now because there was the, the point about it was that it didn't have a center. It wasn't directed from by outside forces or by the normal uh, uh, history as we normally uh, perceive it. it. It was not about those things. You know, that's that's that wasn't what it was, and that wasn't what it was about. And uh, it was about possibilities, I think. And they were in the air. They were just in the air. And everybody was also waiting with the sense of something is about to happen was so imminent, you know what I mean? It was just like everybody knew it, you know, everybody was waiting for this thing to happen, something was going to happen, and it was just so obvious, and everybody did what they could to make it happen, you know, people would try weird shit, you know, I mean, I mean, everybody was, everybody got turned on to pot during this period and loved it, everybody tried other, other forms of, uh, other kinds of drugs, crystal and so forth, and didn't like it so well, or liked it a lot, but it made him crazy, did lots of, you know, uh, and really, what it was was everybody was waiting for uh, psychedelics. Everybody was waiting for LSD, uh, because of what we'd heard about it, what everybody had heard about it, and it seemed like, you know, it seemed like that thing of the sense of losing faith in this reality, like this reality is not. It, this is not that great, you know. This is just is not that. Great. This can't be all there is. There's just not enough to it. There's not enough to it. It's not that interesting. It isn't. It isn't enough fun. It it doesn't. It doesn't require enough of me. It it, it is not a challenge, you know. Uh, there got to be. There's got to be more. When LSD hit the streets finally, that was like it. There, here you were looking for more. Here it is. This is more. This is more than you can imagine. I mean, and for me, that's what that's what that was. I mean, uh, it's not. I realize that uh, drugs are not politically uh, correct, right, at this moment. But um, you know, psychedelics uh, for the people that were waiting for them, they were exactly the thing. They were exactly the thing. You know, I mean, uh, because they have that way of being. Individual, they're not. Uh, nobody, people don't experience exactly the same effects. They experience themselves, uh, and themselves. Sometimes, themselves. It turns out to be utterly delightful. Sometimes it turns out to be a total bummer. But either way, you you've got more of it to work with when you've taken psychedelics and seen it in the bigger picture. You know. So sometimes it meant that I got to get to work, or I'm going to be this way all my life. You know. Sometimes that's what it meant. Sometimes it meant no more uh, psychedelics. They're they're too weird for me. But I think I'd better go join a monastery somewhere because the only way to work this out is the long, slow way. You know, uh, un, un, unpanicked, unhurried. Um, some people it was like psychedelics. Yes, okay. Where's the next terminal? You know, I'm ready. You know, <laughs> I'm ready to move to the next square. You know, and 
you know, it, it, it hit people where they needed to be hit, and it was the thing that everybody was waiting for. You know, and it, it was, and everything opened right, up right in front of it, boom, like that. It was, it was truly amazing. And that 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 hole lasted for about a year, a year and a half, maybe. There was like this magic kind of hole uh, when the LSD was still legal. It hadn't been made illegal yet, and uh, the idea of being high was so new that nobody recognized it, and uh, you were free to, to freak out completely, get as high as you wanted to, out in the open, <laughs> and they couldn't take you to jail for it, and that was really a wonderful thing to have experienced, you know, that was like, you know, I mean, after that, there's no really, I mean, for me, in my life, there's no turning back, there was no back, you know, it's not, not just a matter of turning back, but the idea of backness was gone. <laughs> and like, all directions were forward from there. You know what I mean? And uh, as far as like information and uh, material, you know, like, it's like having so much material. I mean, and it stays with you too. Like the experiences that I experienced back, back in those days, the psychedelic days, they were more real than anything I ever experienced in this on this level. You know, they were they were way more real. You know, they had they were so, so much more detailed and lifelike and uh, and uh, beautiful and horrible and everything else and and, and 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 all the way you know down to the teeny tedious weeniest uh, smallest iota of discriminant material. Uh, every bit of it was, you know. Was it, it was incredible. I don't know. You know, I uh, that that's just one of the, one of the reasons I sort of disqualify myself from this discussion on a serious level is because there simply is uh, conventional wisdom uh, won't accept uh, this subjective of a, a overview. You know, for me, that's the point. That's what it well, uh, that's what it was about. It was, that it was was subjective and um, you know. I'm, I'm so glad that it happened in my lifetime yeah. and that I got to experience it at its purest, you know, I'm just, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world, really, don't you? And, uh, hey, that's it, you know. <laughs> you remember, go for it, yeah. You remember the first time you met Bill Christian? I don't remember the first time. I, I met him when he was working with a friend of mine named Troy Weidenheimer. We played in a band together, uh, I forget what the name of the band was. But we played the band together. I played bass and he played drums. And he was 17 years old. And, uh, you know, he was like a teenager, just a kid, you know. And I played a few shows with him and stuff like that. And then when when uh, me and uh, Big Ben and Weir talked about ha uh, putting together a, a, you know, like a le an electric blues band or something of that sort, uh, the only drummer that I really played with around that area that I felt really had a nice feel was Bill. Who was 17 or 18? By now, by now he's 18. Uh, so I talked to him, and he was he was just as weird as ever. And I, I really really didn't understand anything he said. <laughs> he was just like, you know, I, what? He's like, and I okay. <laughs> you know? I asked him if he wanted to play. And he was delighted. He was just all over the place, and, and he, you know, so we played. It was great. You know, it worked. He worked out fine. Uh, I didn't realize what a truly strange person he was until we started getting high together. And that was a whole other, no, a whole other bill jumped out, you know. And, uh, was, that, that, that bill was a total, uh, a total imp. He, he told me that he remembers being here, seeing you play the tangent upstairs. Yeah. And told himself, play with Oh, that's neat. What about Pigpen? Right Pigpen, I don't even remember when I met, when I met him, he was like 14. He's like a grubby little kid, you know, from that lived down there in, uh, near Los Altos, and uh, you know he played a, a little harmonica and a little a little guitar. He used to ask me to show him some guitar licks, blues licks, and I would show him stuff. And he picked up the guitar by himself, and in about a month, in about a couple of months, he was playing, you know, like pretty nice. He had a real feeling for the music, and he it was in his ears. It was his father was the first rhythm uh, 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 and blues disc jockey in the Bay Area. So he, he'd been hearing the music all his life, and, and uh, he had a real feel for it. It was very natural to him. He was a great guy. He was very funny, too. He had uh, uh, 
pig, pig pit had a, a, a real pixie quality. It was just lo really lovable, really fun. He was a sweetheart. To jump forward to the future a little bit, I, uh, I interviewed Eddie Kraken over at Silicon Graphics. He's, uh, um, he's, a, he's a CEO there. He's a real fan here. He's got your art up on the walls, where one of your ties. Have you ever met him? We can afford him. <laughs> I haven't met him yet. I've, but I've, I've tried to, to, to wheedle uh, uh, maybe a, you know, a bar or a loader, uh, a computer, uh, his silicon graphics uh, rig that I could screw around with. <laughs> I like the power it's got. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it'd be great to really go on tour to make that music. Cutting edge. Can you talk about it? Uh, well, I don't know about the music itself, it's just the approach, you know. Uh, we, well, it's just, it's just part of, that's what you, it's, we're just moving into the 90s, I mean, you know, or actually moving into the, uh, the next millennium. It's, uh, uh, our music wants to exp uh, have as much, uh, as many possible ways to express itself as it can, and it's just, it's just another tool, it's more tools. Do you, do you ever get together with some of the companies that develop this stuff? No, not really. Uh, I, I tend not to be... Uh, I'm not... A, uh, I, so far, let me put it this way. My ideas tend not to be musical. I don't want really want to be in the musical part of it. Uh, I'm much more interested in the, the, the graphic part of it. Uh, you know, it's possible that sometime I'll do get into the musical part of it. But, and I mean, I'm, I'm converse with it. I'm converse with it. But it, it isn't isn't my favorite way of working yet. Yeah. Did you work with Roy Rosenfeld? Is that name ringing a bell? Or yeah. Planet Blue, I think is what it was. Uh, down in L.A.? Yeah. Yeah, Maury, yeah. I saw the video you guys made. It was really nice. Yeah. He's a nice guy. Yeah, he's good, too. Um, and, and then Dana Morgan was a place you used to, you used to teach. And I, Corey Lurio said he talked to him. He said he could write the music for this after. He said that he used to teach at Dana Morgan and go over to Swain's House of Music and... I didn't really work at Swain's. I, I used to work at uh, uh, Dana Morgan's and then me and Bob used to go over and work at uh, this place called... Uh, what the hell is it called? Drapers? Gu no, guitar maybe it was Drapers. No, it wasn't Drapers. It was, it, was, it was Guitar City or something like that. It was... What the hell is the guy that ran it? I don't remember. It wasn't Drapers, I don't think. No. It was up on uh, El Camino. Uh, and this very nice guy ran the place. It was a good little guitar store. We was a, 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 uh, and I both taught up there, you know, like after hours kind of. It was our moonlighting job. <laughs> <laughs> with the um, with the Warlocks, I remember you going to see Bill play because he was my drum teacher back in those days. And, uh, and uh, you're playing at Magoo's now. Magoo's, yeah, that was our first gig. I know. Well, yeah, the close to it. My yearly, yeah. And he told I asked him how much he was getting paid, and he said free beer and pizza. Yeah, something like that. I don't even know if we got pizza, to tell you the truth. We didn't charge anybody anything to get in or anything. But the place was packed. It was packed to the rafters. The second we played on like on Tuesday night or something like that. The second Tuesday night we played, the place was absolutely floor to ceiling. I mean, it was on on the street. It was just totally, you know, it was amazing. It was incredible. I mean, the first night we played. It ended up that way. Second night we played, it started that way. You know, it just got more and more intense, you know. Ah, and they didn't let us play the third night. <laughs> that was it. Too much, you know, too much going on. With, with, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is that you, you've been associated with people like Kim Kesey and Jack Cassidy and these great minds um, from back in those days. Well, you know, not, not Jack Cassidy, uh, Neil Cassidy. Neil Cassidy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is there something to Could you have done that in uh, Boise, Idaho? I don't think so. I think you'd have to be around the Bay Area, but you also had to be a fan of the, the, the that world. I mean, it, it would help 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 to re have read the books and you know who uh, know you know. And I mean, Neil Cassidy was always around in in the world that I was in. He was like peripheral to it somewhere or another. When I was at the Art Institute, he was somewhere around North Beach there. You know, I knew people who knew him and. I knew people who knew him all over the way, and I finally I got to I got pretty close to him myself. I got to be good friends with him, and uh, he was one of those guys that was, truly was uh, a, a very special person, you know. And one of those one of those things. I mean, you know, for me, I my life is, uh, I mean, psychedelics and Neil Cassidy are almost equal in terms of influence on me. 
I mean, because Neil, Neil, uh, he, I, I don't even know how to say it. I don't even know how to say it. He was his own art, you know. It's like he wasn't a musician. He was a Neil Cassidy. You know what I mean? He was, he was like a, a, a set of one, you know. And, uh, and, and he was it. You know, he was the whole thing, top, bottom, and beginning, everything. And uh, people knew it, you know. And people would, would, be, would be drawn to it and destroyed. Uh, or else they would be repelled from it, you know, I and mean, people react in every conceivable way. I thought he was hilarious. I thought he was just the greatest thing in the world, you know, until, until I really loved him. And I had no fear, no fear of, uh, uh, I never worried about whether I was going to lose my life riding in a car with him. I knew I was going to lose my life. I didn't worry about whether I was going to, I knew I was going to. Yeah, but learning how to give everything up like that is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful tool. And I don't know how else I could have learned it. I, nothing else would have made me learn it, you know. Just like racing over San Francisco, you know, like the San Francisco, say the Pacific Heights, you know, at like 65 miles an hour, you know, making those hills and those corners and going through the signals and in the middle of traffic, just, you know, I'm doing, doing things where you know, I, we can't possibly make this corner. Don't even try it. And the Neil is like, not even, he doesn't even look like he's paying attention to anything the road or anybody or anything and he, he's like and he just whips it and you 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 look out the window and you, you, you know you realize you're on the sidewalk you know and you're you're like a half an inch away from a telephone pole over here and I mean it's just it's just you know just it's just insane you know, totally insane and you're totally safe you know, nothing happened you know you can't, you can't believe that you were able to he did it all the time he's uh, he was that was the thing that he was truly great at um, there was other things that he was really very, very good at, you know, <laughs> but that was the thing he was really great at. He was really something. He was, he was enough to boggle about, you know, quite a few people. I mean, uh, Neil was very taken with, uh, I mean, Kesey was very taken with him, and uh, obviously Jack Kerouac was. You know? And he, he, he was an unbelievable human being, and the energy that he had, and the vocabulary that he had of, um, of gestures and expressions and it was just oh boy he was funny and he also had a tremendous rap too he could yeah <laughs> he, I mean I don't know I don't know what to say about Neil it, you know some people just, just thought he was crazy you know, he's crazy get him out of here I don't want him here you know? a lot of women he frightened them he was too too out of control um, and, you know, and a lot of men tr felt that they had to somehow get involved in contests with him, you know, and for some time, and that doesn't work out good. Uh, they'd always, I don't know what, they'd always try something and, and it didn't work out. The thing about uh, Neil was people wanted to compete with him without having any uh, sense of what competing with him might mean. What is it competing with him? Staying up all night? I don't know what is competing with him. You know, it, was, it was one of those things that wasn't obvious. Anyway, if you want any more than that, you're going to have to talk to somebody else. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>